1997, I was 10 years old. I was just entering puberty, and so was American pop culture, going from radical to edgy in the blink of an eye. We just began learning that our president was having a lengthy affair. South Park changed television forever with its effects being noticed across the spectrum with pro wrestling giving birth to its infamous Attitude Era. In the same year, the flamboyant Spice Girls had the best selling album of the year and we were seeing a general rise of pop stars with personality. Celine Dion, Jewel, Sarah McLachlan, and Paula Cole were all huge with their non-threatening anthems. Arguably the dullest of the lot would be Sean Colvin and her hit Sunny Came Home, which single-handedly proved the worthlessness of the Grammy Awards, winning both Song and Record of the Year in 1998. This opening track to Colvin's concept album A Few Small Repairs, a 13-track album based on a single painting, tells a vague story of the titular character Sunny as she comes home. Honestly, that's all I got out of this one. This is the first track of the album and we're just thrown in, assuming that we know who Sunny is and what her motives are. And if we don't, that we care to find out. She's got a list of names with revenge on her mind. Who are these people and what was she planning? Where was she and how long was she gone? I guess I would have to listen to the rest of the album for those answers, but that simply isn't gonna happen. I mean, unless someone requests it on Patreon, I'm just saying. It's a harmless little ditty that's way too light-spirited and flowery for the story it's trying to tell, but it's hardly the worst song of the year. But it's even farther from the best, and this countdown had to start somewhere, so what better way than to kick things off with the only song Old Dirty Bastard ever protested the awarding of? To my knowledge, anyway. I went and bought me an outfit today that costed a lot of money today. Call up the boys, let's go for the joyride. Space Jam, the 1997 film starring live-action all-star basketball players and classic Warner Brothers cartoon characters, hearkening back to the golden age of cinema, featuring the newly created Lola Bunny, whose tail launched a million ferries, and also had one of the best-selling albums of the year, now available on vinyl, for any wanting hipster to pick up, show off at house parties, then never think about again. Starting things off with a cover of the Steve Miller classic Fly Like an Eagle, the soundtrack featured other smash hits, such as the titular Space Jam theme by the Quad City DJs and R. Kelly's I Believe I Can Fly. Kelly was featured on a second track alongside Jay-Z, who also wrote the album's final track, Buggin', a rap song sung by Billy West as Bugs Bunny, which wasn't as bad as I wanted it to be, or else it definitely would have been on this countdown, instead of what ended up being the worst song on the album. Our number six, Basketball Jones by Barry White and Chris Rock. Basketball Jones was originally performed by Cheech and Chong, backed by a band made up of some of the biggest names in music at the time, including Carole King and George Harrison, who also brought along Billy Preston and Klaus Vormann, who had both performed with him in the Beatles at one point or another. Besides the Steve Miller cover performed by Seal, and That's the Way I Like It, covered by the Spin Doctors and Bismarck Key for... whatever reason, this updated version by Barry and Chris is the weirdest and most pointless. I imagine the producers wanting to fill the movie with basketball themed songs, racking their brains before remembering this odd comedy single from 1973, only writing themselves into a corner, wondering how the hell they were gonna update it for a 90s audience made up of mostly kids. While Cheech Marin sung the original song in a high-pitched voice, this time around, Barry White and Chris Rock take turns. Rock's squeaking in contrast to Barry White's legendarily deep voice isn't even the most irritating factor. It's just the shit he says. Baby, baby, it's a craving. Some of the jokes and overall story from the original are left unchanged. In this case, Jones refers to an addiction. And in the song, Chris, for a little while anyway, talks about his love for the game. And after the game, I always took a shot with my basketball. Every now and then the basketball would pitch my butt, but I didn't mind, because me and my basketball had good, clean fun. Before too long, though, just like in Buggin', things fall off and land in the swamp of resorting to the use of timely pop culture references. I got a basketball, Jones, oh, baby. Wait a minute, y'all not in Where the hell is that for? 
It is painful to see a genuinely talented comedian like Chris Rock be this unfunny. This is a harder fall from grace than Madagascar. At one point, Chris is interacting with clips of Michael Jordan previously recorded at a much worse sound quality and then just spends the last two minutes of the song listing names. This is lame beyond measure. And considering how people bought this album for maybe only two or three songs anyway, there is no way people weren't skipping over this track every time. How you doing? Why don't you sing? Sing? I don't sing. Some topics require a certain level of dignity to handle appropriately. One major example would be the loss of a loved one, but a well-crafted song can sometimes help listeners get through these tragic times. With that said, some artists are better suited to deal with these touchy subjects because they know just what to say and how to say it. Master P- uh... <laughs> After a great intro with shots of a choir singing and morning marchers holding up candles, Master P goes from standing at the forefront in a white suit to wandering the desert, playing with sand and throwing sticks. This, way more than gangsta lean, feels like parody. The first verse of the song, a tribute to Master P's own brother, talks about selling drugs. Is that really on the short list of favorable memories? I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, I just wouldn't have gone with it personally. Looking past the lyrics in the video, P doesn't act like someone who just lost someone incredibly close to him. When saying he misses his boy, he jumps up and down like a toddler throwing a tantrum. Even when the video takes the questionable desert motif and turns it around, showing a man made of sand laying dead in an hourglass, we don't have enough time to let that powerful imagery settle in before the song samples the sound of jingling change. Some G's never change, damn they kill you for some change. To every ghetto person that lost their loved ones to these ghetto scandals. Take a Dude, come on. During the sea murder verse, we get some biblical imagery with a walking stick turning into a snake and a shot of a burning bush. These shots do make things easier to take seriously, but I'm just unsure why these references pop up on this song. It could be that the song is 20 years old, and I hate to sound cold about this, but for a song about Master P's late brother, the song doesn't deal with the situation with the necessary tact to make you feel what he's no doubt feeling. This wouldn't be the only major hip hop tribute as 1997 also saw I'll Be Missing You sent out to the notorious B.I.G. It's kinda hard when you're not around Know you in heaven smiling down When I die, fuck it, I wanna go to hell Those two hits may have missed the mark, but I believe their hearts were in the right place. And I appreciate rappers shedding the unaffected macho facade, if only for a second, to show some raw emotion and speak from the heart. Especially today, when you're always hearing about death in the African American community resulting from police brutality, gang warfare, or simple misunderstandings, I think it would be a good idea to take a break from the braggadocious showboating and Twitter feuds every now and then to shine some light on the real issues affecting the community. Get some big names together, start a movement, and speak out against the injustice. We gotta stick together, we all we got. We when all police we got. taking shots and I ain't talking about Syrah. Would it be possible to not have Diddy involved? Is that an option? Call up the boys, let's go for the joy ride. Hey, remember Smash Mouth? Of course you do! Despite not having a hit since 2001, this ragtag bunch of bras was the focus of the second biggest meme of 2016. But I'm not sure which hurts more, over a decade wallowing in mediocrity, or being runner-up to a segmented, honey-harvesting jazz enthusiast that exponentially increases in speed, volume, or both! But yeah, All Star saw a pretty impressive, be it random resurgence, making me forget all about the last time Smash Mouth went viral. That time Steve Harwell cursed out and threatened to beat up a man for throwing bread at him. You throw one more piece of shit on fucking stage, I'm gonna come find your ass. Someone either mistook the concert for Rocky Horror Picture Show or Steve for a duck, but that's irrelevant. We're not talking about All Star or the album it came from. 
Nope, instead we're talking about Fushio Mang with classic tracks including The Fonz, Flow, and... It's impossible to just focus on one track, so we won't. Number four, Fushio Mang. All of it. The album's high point and leading single, Walking on the Sun, works because the music matches Steve's natural intensity, or lack thereof. It's toned down considerably and requires a lot less yelling, which was one of the cringier aspects of the rest of the tracks. The single had more of a social message, while the others were just failed attempts at humor, including a musical love note to Arthur Fonzarelli, which is as random as it sounds. Harlow's vocals ruin any song, be it ska or punk, which is frustrating as some of these songs could pass as obscure Green Day b-sides. It makes me wonder how the same writer is responsible for both the music and the lyrics. They're dumb and not even in a goofy bloodhound gang or mindless self-indulgence kind of way. They're just bad, and I can't see any self-respecting human singing along to any of these songs except for maybe Why Can't We Be Friends? but they can hardly take credit for that. And even then, you might just find yourself singing extra loud to drown out Steve. With a different frontman and better lyrics, this had potential of being an album people would still be raving about decades later. Instead, any points gained by the interesting musical choices, including surf and lounge elements, are overshadowed by Steve's nasal shouting and Fushio Mang ends up the physical interpretation of 90s meh. Can we be friends? Can we be friends? Call up the boy, let's go for the joyride. Between the 1930s and 40s, jazz went through a transformation. An evolution that took it to the airwaves, with big bands expanding on the jazz sound, eventually creating a new genre altogether, swing. The 1950s saw swing change even more, taking on a new form called jump blues, but was pushed aside by the blossoming rock and roll. With a few decades gone by, rock took all sorts of varied forms with influences all over the world, and we were dropped into the 90s with endless possibilities. In one decade alone, we saw hair metal transform into grunge and alternative rock. We saw the rise of house, techno, and trance. Hip-hop went mainstream. The late 90s were marked by an influx of country stars like Faith Hill and Shania Twain, as well as Latin artists such as Ricky Martin and Enrique Iglesias crossing over into the pop charts. But there was another movement, not as fondly remembered. Our number three, bringing it full circle, the revival of Swing. Initially, with innovators like Duke Ellington and Count Basie along for the ride, Swing wasn't an all-out gentrification of the jazz genre. The same can't be said, however, for the 90s revival, New Swing being the whitest thing to happen to music since nationalist socialist black metal. Thanks to the movie Swingers, the genre saw a very short-lived moment above ground, like a cicada buzzing obnoxiously from the trees in 1997, ending abruptly sometime the next year. Although bands like Big Bad Voodoo Daddy and the Squirrel Nut Zippers had been playing retro swing for years, it was the Cherry Poppin' Daddies that first put the genre on the charts. CPD, who up to this point specialized in ska, bit the bullet and released their retro swing single Zoot Zoot Riot as a new exclusive track for their greatest hits compilation, a dick move on multiple fronts. Lead daddy Steve Perry used the song as an excuse to dress like a cheap Dick Tracy villain and look like an overall chode in the video, but I can't blame him. It's not like he would ever get the chance again, as this would be the only taste of notoriety the band would ever get. Zoot Suit Riot would leave the speakeasy door wide open allowing Brian Setzer, previously of Stray Cats fame, to stroll on in with his orchestra and a cover of Louis Prima's Jump Jive and Wail. The songs were commercial successes, but the genre itself never got past the novelty phase. With the original version of Jump Jive and Wail and an ad for Gap brand khakis, the genre had finally found its calling. It's basically what happened to dubstep. It was pretty big there for a while, but we weren't sure what its practical application would be. In both cases, it ended up being marketing teams that built those brick walls that put an end to both short-lived trends. But if you ask me, we probably could have done without them both altogether. 
call up the boy. Let's go for the joyride. Barbie Girl, the smash hit that launched a million real doll purchases, was the only US hit single for the Danish Norwegian pop group Aqua. And much like in the case of Smash Mouth, their hit single is leaps and bounds above the rest of their songs in quality. In hindsight, it would appear the whole album is centered around Barbie Girl and the rest of the tracks were just slapped together in a rush. The worst offender is our number two, Lollipop, parentheses, Candyman. Poor translation is pretty common when you're dealing with a foreign pop act making music for American audiences, but Lollipop has a few too many confusing lyrics to overlook. In Barbie Girl, the innuendo was obvious, but here, we're not so lucky. Aqua's frontman Renee saying he's a sweet sugar candy man has a few implications. Either he's selling candy, made of candy, or vomits bees. Later, he tells Lena, the group's female vocalist, that she can bite him if she's hungry, which one would assume would be sexual, but he follows it up by saying that this would mean the end of him. In addition, Lena also calls him Sugar Top, which leads me to believe that he is a talking lollipop and is some sort of Adventure Time nightmare. This, however, is contradicted by Lena asking the Candyman to give her a soda pop for free, or as she puts it, and beyond what the Candyman is, it's imperative to ask who the Candyman is and why he sounds so menacing. Lena, at one point, says that his word is her command, but who is he to be giving commands? And the biggest question of all, what or where is Bounty Land? I have the Candyman. The ambiguity of the lyrics and the production remind me of a forgotten Ace of Bass track, and who knows? Maybe Aqua was trying to sell us fascism all along, but luckily for us, they were only one-hit wonders and weren't successful in brainwashing a whole generation of impressionable youths with Barbie Girl alone, but I can't help but wonder what it all could have led up to. Candy Men could have been the nickname to the doctors prescribing us with sedatives to turn us into Barbie Girls, i.e. living zombies, but nah, I'm probably just overthinking things. It's gotta be simpler than that. I mean, the name of the band is Aqua. Water? Water. Something's in the water. Could it be fluoride? I don't want to alarm you folks. I mean, fear mongering is not in my nature. But we are under attack! There's demons! Infiltrated our airwaves, you scum! We know it was you and we're coming for you! <sighs> Sorry, man. Your candy! There's no use against our supplements available on my website. Now cleared to move. The globalists, they want you brain dead, but I will not stop. The people deserve to know. I won't be silenced. <laughs> oh God, oh my God. I'm getting to the bottom of this. That's it. All further reviews are put on notice. Fuck it. I'm sorry, this is a family show. I don't mean to curse, but. All that's gonna have to wait, cause this is important! What's this? Ooh. <laughs> Moving on. Call up the boy, let's go for the joy ride. Let's fast forward to 2012 and WrestleMania 28. Follow me here. The Undertaker, with his undefeated WrestleMania streak still intact, demanded a rematch with the WWE's COO Triple H. Certain he would not only defeat the dead man, Triple H feared he would force Taker into retirement and initially turned down the challenge. After some personal and snarky button pushing, Hunter had heard enough and finally accepted in a match that would, as every promo package would claim, end an era. An era of what? I couldn't tell you, as there were seemingly zero consequences. They did a great deal of build-up for this match with excellent promos, but the song they chose to represent the feud still has me scratching my head. Our number one, The Memory Remains by Metallica. Now I don't know about you, but nothing conjures up visions of brutal cage matches more than a middle-aged Marion Faithful organ grinder and James Hetfield practically puking his lyrics over an unsuspecting microphone. But the memory remains. The memory remains. 
<laughs> On par with Unforgiven 2 in the cheese department, the memory remains as a product of Metallica's 1997 album Reload, or as I call it, Songs of Blood and Piss. With 1991's self-titled Black album, their deal with the devil was complete, teaming with producer Bob Rock, who transformed Metallica's aggressive metal-up-your-ass grit into a more generic, marketable sound, like a raw and unapologetic horror film re-edited for a more accessible PG-13 rating. This is Metallica on autopilot. These lyrics are so empty that they must have meant more in his head, but it's hard to tell if his heart was truly in it at this point. With lyrics about fame, mansions, and faded prima donnas, is this Metallica seeing into their own future? The song hits hard at times, but it's otherwise monotonous for the majority, and the Marianne Faithful feature is... stupid. I guess it's supposed to be haunting. This singer, previously known for her relationship with Mick Jagger, a musical career in her own right, and a rather nasty rumor involving a Mars bar droning on in the background between verses, but it makes me laugh every time. It's silly, and it's even funnier to picture Metallica in the studio listening to the playback, all nodding to each other, with James looking over at Marianne, giving her a thumbs up and faking a smile. In the video, Marianne is a carny of sorts, taking the band's antique coins in exchange for a ride on a swinging, rotating stage that doesn't reflect the song's lyrics in any way, and they don't do nearly enough with it to merit how much the video costs to make. It isn't even going that fast! How aren't they sliding and falling off? This could also be the douchiest James has ever looked, wearing fashionable sunglasses, making dumb faces and a fisheye lens. I am interested in what the story behind Marion Faithful's character is supposed to be, however. When she isn't grinding, she's seen sitting on a chair cradling a stuffed monkey and leading a funeral dirge. This, again, has nothing to do with the song, and I gotta ask, why Marianne Faithful? It's not like metal fans in 97 knew who she was. La did it da indeed.